Okay. <clears throat> Short cervix and progesterone. So this is this is the best for last. Um, right. So we're going to talk about identifying this short cervix. What does it mean when you found a short cervix? What's a normal cervical length and its correlation with preterm delivery? And also management, but also management with an emphasis for progesterone. This is a transvaginal scan <coughs> and this is the vagina and this is the cervix here. And we're just measuring in here and there's a little funnel in here. So that's what a short cervix looks like. <clears throat> so there are a lot of different scenarios you'll come across. So a young girl, she's had two pregnancies and both ended before 24 weeks. First one, 22 weeks spontaneous preterm labour. 20 weeks she had in her next pregnancy. At 20 weeks she had a short cervix, so she had an emergency circlage and then she went on to labour at 22 weeks. What do you do in her next pregnancy? What do you say to her when you undergo preconceptual counselling? <coughs> well, what about more commonly a 30 year old with a cone biopsy? What do you do for her? Or maybe a 40 year old who's had four kids and a mixture of term deliveries or preterm deliveries. That's quite common too. <coughs> How do you manage these pregnancies? So what causes a short cervix? So congenital abnormalities. Now this is a uterine didalpha, so this woman's got two uteruses or the uterus hasn't fused. So they both start off at two, two and then they fuse. So this is a uterine didalpha. But that's just an example. <coughs> Cervical surgery, such as cone biopsy, or more commonly multiple LITS procedures. So tiny little LITS procedures, but they can add up to maybe a cone biopsy. So they, they alter the integrity of the cervical canal. <coughs> cervical insufficiency, now this is a global term, and it's defined as the inability of a cervix to re retain a pregnancy in the absence of contractions or labour. And the often presenting symptom is vaginal pressure. But it's very hard to diagnose someone with true cervical insufficiency. Usually there's a history of bleeding or ruptured membranes or, or labour. How do you know it's really cervical insufficiency? <coughs> Intraamniotic infection or inflammation, 50% of those who present with a short cervix will have intraamniotic infection and it's a high association with a cervical length of less than 5mm, so a normal cervical length is around about 30mm. <coughs> but what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the short cervix and it's let the infection go up or has there been infection floating around that has made the cervix short? We don't know. This is progesterone. It's thought that a suspension of progesterone action or a decline in progesterone has been implicated in the control of cervical ripening and preterm labour. And that's the key to prevention. <coughs> Risk factors, history, history of preterm birth, and I'll, I'll show you something about that later. Extremes of maternal age, a low BMI, um, and some ethnicities. High risk groups, and high risk groups are the ones that you'll target for screening. Um, a history of spontaneous preterm birth in a prior pregnancy. A short cervix at least of less than 25 millimetres, less than 24 weeks in a current pregnancy. Now how do you know it is less than 25 millimetres? You might have screened her because she's had a, a LETS procedure or cone biopsy, or the sonographer may have done a scan for, I don't know, a growth scan or, or morphology and had a look at the top and thought, oh, that cervix looks a bit low, I might do a transvaginal scan and just double check. <coughs> the risks of preterm birth are higher the earlier the gestational age of preterm pre birth, the, the previous one, the shorter the cervical length, and the earlier in pregnancy the short cervix was diagnosed. Look at these. If you don't treat them, the risk of recurrent preterm birth is up to 60%, less than 37 weeks. That's if you leave, leave all these risk factors untreated. So here's a nice, nice table from IAMS. <coughs> 
And if you want to read about short cervixes, Iams is quite a prolific author of uh, preterm birth. Um, so if you've had a prior second trimester loss, you've got nearly a 30% chance of another second trimester loss or over a 30% chance of spontaneous preterm birth. So preterm birth delivery between 24 and 37 weeks. If your previous pregnancy was spontaneous preterm birth, it's actually not that high for a second trimester loss, but you do have a 40% chance of another preterm birth. And so it's these groups that we're targeting prior second trimester loss and prior preterm birth. If you had a prior full term delivery, slightly higher risk of spontaneous preterm birth. Yep. So how do we detect a short cervix? We use ultrasound and the gold stand is a transvaginal ultrasound. There are a lot of protocols and this is, <coughs> this is one of the, it's quite a standard one. Um, so we always do it on an empty bladder uh, we clean the probe, uh, we guide the probe to the anterior fornix of the vagina, we obtain a long axis, so this is a, oh, this is a long axis of a cervix, um, and we, we view the entire cervix on the screen and the, the cervix should occupy two thirds of the image. We don't put any pressure on the cervix because that can make the cervix longer and provoke a contraction, and we watch it. Sometimes it's spontaneously funnels or decompresses, sometimes it spontaneously shortens. We also apply fundal pressure which can be here or just on, on top of the bladder and we see if the cervix shortens with pressure, most of the time it lengthens. So this is a cervix, this is a normal length, that's internal loss, this is the baby here, black's fluid, this is the vagina, it's external loss, so that's a nice cervical canal and we know it's a nice image because they're pretty similar in size, it's not squashed, if it's squashed that will be quite thin <coughs> and we measure it. This is a slightly shortened cervix, you can see here, so this is where the internal loss should be and it's sort of opened up a little bit, it's shortened a bit here and that's what we'll measure. This is another one, so it's not always that easy to detect it. What does this mean? This looks like the first picture. It looks nice and long and solid. What does this mean here? This round bit. Is it funneling? Has she had a contraction? We don't really know. But what's relevant is that length here. So you wa we watch it and we see, sometimes it could be a contraction, and most of the time it is. This is traditionally, this is a very recent um, <coughs> paper, and this is from the Mater in Brisbane where I did my fetal medicine. Um, they were doing this paper while I was training there. <coughs> this is classically um, what a shortened cervix looked like, and they do, they, they describe it by alphabet. So T, nice and closed and it's straight. A Y looks like a Y, a V looks like a V, and a U looks like a U, and it's supposed to describe that shortening. But it's not that straightforward. Here, there's mucus in the canal. So, does a cervix that look like that, with a lot of mucus there, is that the same as this V, or is it the same as the T? That can be difficult interpretation. It's thought that this is a new concept that's described in, for us, but this, this round thing here is the membrane. So you can see the membranes go into the canal, mm. and that one doesn't. So it's thought that you measure up to the membranes rather than measuring the length of the cervix, so that's going to be a change. These aren't, this column here is not at any, any increased risk of preterm labour, but you can see why people are uh, thought to have short cervixes on scan because someone will look at that and go, hang on, that looks like it's short, it looks like it's open, and it's not. We do have charts for cervical length, and this is how, this is a Solomon chart, it's the most popular chart, it's been around for decades, well not decades, probably a decade. 
and this is the gestation in weeks and this is the change in cervical length over gestation. This is the first centile, 99th centile. And this is interesting because you get look at that variation. The first centile is well over 20 millimetres here. This is an interesting chart, you don't need to know it. Cervical length down this side, week of pregnancy here. Again, I'm just picking 20 millimetres because that's the most common number people use. Some people use 25. But as your pregnancy, as your cervical length gets shorter, the more likely uh, the chance of preterm delivery. And it's best demonstrated on these charts. This is a bit... A bit uh, so, here we go. Delivery within seven days and the cervical length. Here we go, 20 millimetres again. <coughs> So if the cervix is less than 20 millimetres, you're starting to increase your risk of preterm birth within seven days. So if it's less than five millimetres, you're 90%, 90 likely to deliver. So should we be using this instead of fibronectin? Is it what? Instead of fibronectin. Fibronectin only tells you if the cervix is... I mean, you can do... There are studies looking at additives. Mm -hmm. But it depends on your role of fibronectin. At a tertiary unit, it would tell you you would use it in conjunction with the cervical length to look at probability. Yeah. In a secondary unit, you look at fibronectin to say whether you should be shipping that woman right. out. Yeah. So for those who don't know, fibronectin's <coughs> it's a it's a test that you can do with a woman who comes in with risk of threatened preterm labour. So. Um, it's thought that when the cervix opens at this fibronectin, which is um, part of the uh, matrix between uh, am um, amnion and uterus, th that's released. And so you can detect that on a swab. <coughs> and so if you're detecting fibronectin, um, this woman's at risk of delivery. Um, and so there therefore, if she's at a certain gestation, you should get into a tertiary unit where she can deliver. But if it's negative, it's got a, it's over 90, it's 99% um, because she's not likely to deliver. So you can send her home. So <coughs> in practice, that doesn't happen. So if you've got a negative fibronectin and she's contracting a little bit, most people will keep them in. But in theory, they should be sending them home because the chance of delivering within a week is very low. You know, that's an aside. <coughs> Again, this is very similar. So. This is a rate of delivery. This is uh, people that have uh, women that have delivered based on cervical length. <coughs> so, open square. So the the white ones is delivery within 48 hours. So there's that five millimeter again. Um, the black, the shaded box is delivery in seven days, and the black box is delivery less than 35 weeks. So progesterone, progesterone. So there are there have been many, um, many, many papers over the years about progesterone, uh, looking at cervical length, when to give it, types of progesterone, and this is the latest definitive paper. It's um, by Romero and Nicolaides. Nicolaides group publishes quite a bit. Um, especially in the fetal medicine circle, so it's quite a reliable paper. <coughs> um, so they're looking... So this is a meta-analysis and a systematic review, looking at asymptomatic women, so women without symptoms, with a sonographic cervix that's short of less than equal to 25 millimetres. <coughs> so these are the results. Reduced risk of preterm birth of less than 28 weeks by 50%. That's better than a cerclage. A cerclage is a stitch you're putting around the cervix to hold the cervix in. 40% less than 33 weeks and 30% less than 35 weeks. <coughs> Not only does it reduce the risk of preterm birth, the neonatal outcome's better. <coughs> So you've got a reduced risk of respiratory distress syndrome by 52%. Reduced risk of neonatal information, uh, neonatal information, uh, neonatal admission by 
reduced need for mechanical ventilation, that's intubation. There's a huge move in the neonatal circles to move away from mechanical ventilation because of the risk of chronic lung disease and they're using a lot more positive pressure ventilation which is uh, thought to be safer for babies. So that's a very good outcome for them. And a lower rate of low birth weight babies and that's because you're getting babies further on in gestation. So what did they recommend? They recommended in this paper transvaginal cervical length at 19 to 24 weeks. They didn't say how often, but it all depends on the clinical history. And if we're screening, we do fortnightly from 16 weeks, and I'll talk to you about an algorithm later. This paper also looked at the different doses of progesterone, and it looked to see the minimum dose required to achieve an effect. There are a lot of different doses. There was 200 milligrams a day, there's 400 milligrams a day, there was oral progesterone, IM progesterone, vaginal pr progesterone. The lowest recommended dose is 90 milligrams per day, vaginally to achieve effect. And I think our one's 200, but it doesn't matter. For using it preventatively, you'd start from 16 weeks. But before we used to use it up to 28 weeks and then 34 weeks, and now they recommend in 37 weeks. Right, mechanism of action. So how does progesterone work? So a decline in the progesterone has been implicated in the control of cervical ri ripening and preterm labour, so it increases the progesterone levels in the mum, so it tricks her, her body into thinking that she's still pregnant or she's not going to go into labour, so it doesn't have that dip of progesterone before she goes into labour. <coughs> it's thought to have anti-inflammatory properties, which is quite good if you've got some sort of infection floating around. Um, and there's just a bit more physiology. So if the progesterone is thought to impair the uterine gap junction formation. So the gap junctions aren't being formed to go into labour. So it counteracts the coordinated contractile efforts. So if they're going to contract, it's not coordinated. So it doesn't provoke them into preterm labour. It also has a direct action on oxytocin. Well, not oxytocin, oxytocin receptors. And it reduces the sensitivity of the receptors to oxytocin. Mm, a bit more than you thought. So what about a circlage? Does that mean no circlages for anyone? Well, here's another study, again from the Nicolaides group. <coughs> this is a really clever study. A, it's an indirect comparison study, so, and it's a meta-analysis, so they looked at different studies. It may not have been comparing the same things, but it's very clever statistics so they can indirectly compare them as different groups. They found that both of them were equally aphasious, aphasious in the prevention of preterm birth in women with a sonographic short cervix in the mid trimester, singleton pregnancy and, pre and risk of pre uh, uh, previous preterm birth. So these are the high risk groups. So the efficacy is similar. So they're saying we should take into account other considerations. How do you know which one to pick? Do I pick a surclage or do I pick progesterone? <coughs> take into account costs. And costs for surclage would include theatre costs, patient preference, physician preference, complications relating to surgical procedures, the anaesthetic risk, surgical procedure, complications associated with that. Saying that some women prefer the thought of a mechanical obstruction and would prefer that. Progesterone compliance, they have to take it every day. You can't have fluctuating levels. <coughs> what about twins? So sorry, mm. when you say mm. they have to take it, you mean they have to insert the every day. piss ring? Yep, every day. Do, do they do that at bed? Most will do it at bedtime before they go to bed. Yeah. Brush their teeth and set the pessary. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but they do. And the ones that are driven and don't want to go through that experience again, they will do it, even if it means prolonging their pregnancy. And a lot of women have had awful experiences and it's just getting them past that 24 week stage, getting them past that 28 week stage. And are you going to mention sexual intercourse? No. <laughs> do, you want <laughs> do you want to update us? Like, you know, there was the old-fashioned thing about, you mm. know, what if they didn't have, you know, 
I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think it's people just say, that they might feel don't. That That's like bed rest, isn't it? Yeah, there's no evidence yeah. not to. So, you, so they can still have sex with progesterone history? Oh, yeah, I'm sure they do, yeah. <laughs> there's no studies to say don't. Yeah. I did have a woman, well, not about sex, but um, she had an abdominal cerclage and a grade 4 placenta previa, previous mid-trimester losses. The reason she had an abdominal cerclage was because she was a bit older and they thought, well, this is, you haven't got many chances left, we'll just do that. But I gave her progesterone anyway. And it's interesting because women with abdominal cerclages usually deliver a bit early because they'll labour on the cerclage. She didn't labour on the cerclage, she made it to her Caesar date. Um, and I think it's a progesterone, I think it just mm -hmm. suspended that action. So, so there's a role so for both. Can combine, you can combine, there's no studies combining them, but I would. And we, we do that clinically, so if you have an emergency cerclage, we'll give progesterone. Or if you've got a short cervix on scan, we'll start progesterone and then do the cerclage. Yeah. So twins, first of all, cerclage is out with twins. There's an increased risk of, um, of preterm birth with the cerclage, so that's out, so it actually increases harm. With progesterone, it, it needs bigger sample sizes and that's hampered it really. There's been a, a trend, a non-significant trend towards prolongation of pregnancy, um, but there's a reflection of sample sizes and uh, there's only been about 80 twin pairs to date, so it's not big enough to assess that. But there is a reduction in composite neonatal morbidity by 50%. And if you read studies, composite neonatal morbidity is the big thing. It's saying our sample size is not big enough to look at individual components, but we'll combine, combine all the individual components to try and get a, a result or to see whether there's a statistically significant difference. So they may combine admission to neonatal unit, ventilation rate, intraventricular hemorrhage, jaundice, combine it all and see if there's a difference. In, that way they'll get some, it's just falsely increasing your samples, not falsely, but it's just increasing your sample size. So there is some evidence that it may be good for the babies. But there's no harm, so what have you got to lose? So what about an algorithm? Here's um, the Canadians again. There's a lot of these algorithms around, and this is just one example of an algorithm. Um, they go straight to a cerclage when they've had three or more second trimester losses or preterm births. In our unit, we seriously consider an abdominal cerclage and we give progesterone. Oh, there we go, abdominal cerclage. Um, expectant management, serial cervical lengths from 16 weeks to weekly. And if it's, and, and give progesterone. And some will, um, some will keep going with the progesterone, but some will, if the cervix shortens on the progesterone, will do an emergency cerclage on top of that. I haven't gone into emergency cerclages, but they're very controversial, and there's a vote towards moving away from them. But if you've got, a, if, if you've got an open cervix, there's a high rate of intra-amniotic infection. Um, a lot of the times we do give them antibiotics just to settle them for 48 hours and see where the lie of the land is. Um, and, then you, and then put the cerclage in. The problem is if you're doing a cerclage at 22 weeks, are you converting a mid-trimester loss to an early neonatal death or, or a neonate you know, when they deliver at 24 weeks with a high risk of morbidity? And a lot of the times they do go on shortly to deliver and you you're changing that and I don't think some women do they do want a 24 week but some women that's the last thing they want so it's a lot of counselling it's a lot of difficult counselling with that okay so this is looking at one with prior preterm birth serial cervical lengths progesterone um, and consideration of a cerclage if, on top of the progesterone if the cervix goes on to shorten <coughs> Now a lot of you, well, some of you will recognise these statements. These are statements from WHO and this is a definition of a screening test. <laughs> and I remember having to memorise this a lot of times before exams. Mostly related to cervical cancer screening and 
why it wasn't justified as a good screening test for the population. But again, I studied it for my um, subspecialty exam. So first of all, the condition must be an important health problem, and we'll all, all agree that preterm birth is a, is a very good, very important health problem uh, with um, a significant impact. This should be an accepted treatment for patients with a recognised disease. And I think both treatments are acceptable. And now that we've got a great treatment of progesterone that will reduce the rate by up to 50% of preterm birth, great. Must have facilities for diagnosis and treatment, yes. Some will argue that a transvaginal scan should be standardised. And in America they do have a, a course, you have to be certified to perform a transvaginal scan. In the UK, New Zealand and Australia you don't need to, but there is a sort of movement to that because of the difficulties of uh, interpretation. <clears throat> there should be a recognised latent stage and again progressive cervical shortening is present in screening for that and you can argue, argue that a short cervix or a shorter cervix um, uh, is a latent stage in preterm delivery. And there should be a suitable test or examination. Transvaginal scan is a, a fantastic um, examination. No transabdominal scan, it false, falsely elevates. elevates. A full bladder on a transabdominal scan will make the cervix appear longer than it is because the bladder elongates the cervix. <coughs> also, visualisation is not, not, not particularly good. Um, the test should be acceptable to the population and if you explain to a woman why she's getting a transvaginal scan, she'll be happy to have it. And natural history should be understood and um, even though the underlying mechanisms of preterm birth are a bit unclear and there is quite multifactorial, um, there's good observational evidence about the natural history of a short cervix. And there should be a policy on who to treat and who to treat as a patient. And, there's lots of policies and protocols around and you know that was one there. The cost of screening should be economically balanced and you'll all agree that a neonate at 28 weeks is a very expensive stay, very expensive baby. So if you can get that ba reduce that baby's neonatal stay by getting it further on in the pregnancy, it's a good thing. And the case findings should be a continual process, and it, and it definitely is. <coughs> so there's lots of guidelines. Cervical insufficiency and um, cervical circlage um, that was recently updated based on that study I talked about, that indirect comparison study. Um, our college has a guideline of progesterone in the second and third trimester for the prevention of preterm birth. It also has a first trimester guideline, and I haven't talked about that today, but there is a move for using progesterone with threatened, pre uh, threatened miscarriages as well, um, and those with recurrent miscarriages, using them routinely. So those that have threatened miscarriages who have progesterone are more likely to continue the pregnancy than go into miscarriage. Right. So what's coming up in the future? There's a lot of um, things about. A few of you might remember the ORACLE study. Now the ORACLE stands for Overview of the Role of Antibiotics in the Curtailment of Labour in Early Delivery. So the ORACLE study looked at two arms. It was involved 15 countries. They looked at those with ruptured membranes and they gave antibiotics and they looked at the outcome and looked at women with threatened preterm labour with intact membranes, gave them antibiotics and looked at the outcome. This is a seven year follow up based on the ORACLE study. And the woman who had preterm labour with intact membranes, who received erythromycin, had a hot, the babies at seven years had a higher functional impairment compared with the ones who didn't receive erythromycin, any level of functional, and a nearly two times odds ratio of cerebral palsy. Now the mechanism of this is unclear. But you know, it's, a, it's over 6,300 women. And it's thought that an episode of preterm labour which settles could reflect in a subclinical infective episode. So there's some sort of subclinical infection that's provoked the preterm labour. And so the maternal defences have 
overcome this insult and therefore prolong the pregnancy, but the inflammatory component, which is being stimulated by the mum's environment, um, is still going on. So the theory is that a continuing inflammatory environment, subclinical infam inflammatory environment, can lead to fetal brain injury and thereby th cerebral palsy. So at the moment, that's what they're talking about. So that may come up in the future. Are we leaving the fetus in a hostile and uterine environment? And to me, it, it reminds me to be careful of what medications you give to patients. If they've got intact membranes, should you be given antibiotics? The Oracle trial showed no difference for outcome, so you shouldn't be giving them. If they've got a urine infection, yes, but if you've got no clear cause, there's nothing wrong with admitting them, watching them and see what happens. Um, and be careful of the antibiotics you choose as well. It's also highlighted with recurrent steroids as well. So those women, are, I don't know whether you remember going through a vogue of doing weekly, weekly to fortnightly steroids for those at risk of earlier delivery. Those who received over three courses, their babies had a smaller head circumference which would imply some white matter change as a result from that. Mm -hmm. So it just reminds us just to, just to pick what you're giving, think about why you're giving it and do I really need to give it. This may come in, this is called an Arabian pessary. It's German. It, um, it goes in like that. And as the Germans like to do, they MRI everything. So this is the open cervix. This is the pessary that's gone in. And it's altered the angle of the, you can see how the cervical canal's altered. It doesn't, it doesn't um, close the cervix, but it just alters it. So um, they've had some really good results in this. And some places in the UK are using these routinely with sonographic short cervixes. There's not enough evidence here for us to institute that, but um, that may come in the future.